Then Allah describes, فَيَدْ مَغُهُ Then the spear bashes the skull of falsehood in. Now this is a very graphic image in the ayah. Very graphic image. It's not, Allah doesn't just say truth defeats falsehood. Truth kills falsehood. It bashes its skull in. Its, its brains get bashed out. In other words, what we're learning is, truth has no tolerance, has no tolerance for falsehood. Islam has no tolerance for ideas that are contrary to the truth. We're not saying we're intolerant of non-Muslims. That's not what we're saying. We are saying truth cannot stand falsehood. Truth has no tolerance. No, it cannot stand next to it and, and be okay. It, if it sees it, it has to bash its skull in. That's what it has to do. That's what it has to do. That's what it must do by definition. In other words, truth is incredibly offended by the existence of falsehood. It's offended by the existence of falsehood. And we are in a time now where falsehood is offended by the existence of Islam. It's offended by the existence of the truth. This is one problem I wanted to share with you. But add to this one more thing. The elders among us, those of us that come from, a different, from the Muslim world especially, maybe they were attending halaqat when they were younger. They were in the company of scholars when they were younger. They, were, they built this love and affection for the deen as they were growing up. So they have this ghira for Islam. They have this, you know, this, this, uh, this chivalry towards Islam. They have courage and they have this, this confidence in the deen. But that confidence today does not exist among their own children. It does not exist among our youth. Our youth are only at the masjid because we drag them here. They're only at Sunday school because you left without them. They're, they're not here. They're not at the halaqat. The halaqat are filled with people with gray beards and white beards. They're not being attended by the 16-year-olds and the 14-year-olds. And you know what? When they go to school, they are learning that Islam worships the moon god. That's what they're learning in public school. I was listening to a preacher, you know, I, I live in Texas, and there's a lot of, you know, Christian talk radio, a lot of it. And now, there are actually talk radio shows dedicated to the Muslim audience. They want to talk to Muslims, want to bring them from darkness to light, bring them to Jesus. They're talking to Muslims on talk radio, inviting them to call in. And these, they have a supposedly Qur'an expert on the radio show. We want to share our faith with you. We understand you think, you know, that believing that Jesus is the Son of God is shirk. And they know these terminologies and they, they quote ayat of the Qur'an. They're actually out there to give the message of, of Christianity to Muslims. Right? And I'm listening and their evidences are almost, wallahi, laughable. They are laughable. But you know, I also got very scared when I was listening. And I, I called in just to see what happens. Anyway, they, they, they hung up on me, but, you know. But I, want, I was very scared. You know why? What's the biggest weapon these people have? What's the biggest weapon? Those who call to falsehood. And instead of falsehood being on the run, now it's attacking the truth, right? What's the biggest weapon they have? The biggest weapon they have is the ignorance of the Muslims. The biggest weapon they have is that we don't know our deen. Our kids don't know their deen. They don't have the confidence that this is the truth. Instead, and this is the point I want to actually try to conclude with, because this is the heart of the matter, what I want to share with you. I don't just want to bring the problem before you, I want to share with you, how do we get to a solution? How do we start fixing things too? Look, in our times, if you want to learn something about the Qur'an, of course you ask the ultimate sheikh, Google, right? You put in Qur'an or whatever, and you, you want to learn something about the Qur'an and a bunch of hits come up. You know, on the internet, uh, in the media, on YouTube, whatever else, there is far more literature and media and, and content available against the Qur'an, attacking the Qur'an. There's far more available against the Qur'an and very, very little in comparison available in defense of the Qur'an or pro the Book of Allah. The criticisms far outweigh the appreciation of the Book of Allah. I want to share something else with you. For a millennium and a half, this ummah and its scholars that span every continent, every continent, they have been obsessed with the miraculous power of this book. They have been obsessed with the Qur'an's incredible majesty. And how, how it, can't, it can't possibly be the word of a human being. Thousands upon thousands of scholars have given their entire lives studying the miracle of the Qur'an in the Muslim tradition. And then for the last three, four hundred years, the Christian tradition, move up inshallah ta'ala, the crowd is filling up, so uh, move up as much as you can. 
in the Christian world and in the European world, the Quran started being studied formally about 400 years ago. They started studying Islam. Why did they start studying Islam? So they, had, they could defeat the new enemies. That, that was the idea, right? So they have been writing critical works against the Quran for about 400 years now, in the, in the Christian world, basically. Okay. If you try to say, for the average, we're not even talking about the non-Muslim, let's just talk about the Muslim. If the Muslim wants to learn something about the Qur'an, do they have today more access to what has been written by our own scholars about the Qur'an, or do they have easier access to what is the attacks on the Qur'an? They have easier access to the attacks on the Qur'an. Even the Muslim today says, how come this ayah says one day is equal to 50,000, and that Ayah says one day is equal to 1,000. How come he says over here this? How come he says over here that? The Muslim is asking these questions. The Muslim is saying, how come this doesn't make any sense about the Quran? We have reached that point. We have reached that point. Here we were supposed to poke questions to others, and now our own are asking questions about their own book. That is the reality in which we live. How do we counter this reality? How do we produce youth, especially youth, Young men and women, that we are so scared, we've become defensive, right? This, the, one of the uh, things before I conclude this khutbah is the impact of this mentality. This mentality that we have to constantly answer and defend ourselves, right? Instead of Islam being on the ideological offensive, it's on the defensive constantly. What is the consequence of that? We have the idea we have to protect our children from the fitna of the outside world, right? This is haram and that's haram and we have to, you know, how are we going to raise our children? We have to scared, we're scared to death about what's going to happen to our kids. Isn't that the case? You know, if we were really producing children of Islam, if we were producing members of this ummah, carriers of this message, then the entire high school would be scared. Man, my kids, their Christianity is going to go away because there's a Muslim kid in that school. We would have that kind of confidence. We wouldn't shake because of what's around us. Everything around us would shake because we're there. That's the kind of confidence Islam puts in someone when they understand what they believe. When they have the book of Allah empowering them. Right? I know of a case of a brother I know actually, when he was in high school, he had memorized Quran before, he had studied his deen, and he went into public school. And his parents were told, don't put him in public school, put him in you know, Islamic school, or keep him, in the, keep him in the madrasa, this and that. He said, no, I want to go to public school. Ask him why he wants to go to public school. Those people need the message. That's what he said. This 15 year old kid. And he goes, by the time he graduates from high school, 18 kids have become Muslim in that high school. This is confidence in your deen. This is what we're supposed to produce. We're supposed to, we're not, you know in sports they say the best defense is offense, right? The best preservation of our youth is the production of da'is. You produce people that carry this message and deliver this message and are content with this message and are deeply, deeply confident with this message. You produce that and you don't have to worry about them, you know, they're not going to end up at the nightclub and they're not going to do alcohol and they're not going to have a girl, they're not going to worry about these things because they have a higher mission in life then. You've empowered them with something greater. When there's a void of a higher purpose in life, then you have these problems. Then they look for other things to fulfill that void. But our deen gives us purpose. Wallahi, it empowers youth. It, it puts them on a different scale. It puts them on a different platform than everybody else. And you know, we don't, we, we've become a people that want to protect ourselves, cut ourselves off from the rest of society. The only justification, ulama have told you this for decades now. This is not, I'm not the first one to tell you this. The only real justification for Muslims living in this land is da'wah. That's the only real justification. So if we're always hiding away and saying, oh my God, if we're like that, then there's a serious problem. If we don't know how to handle somebody who walks into the masjid, a Jehovah's Witness, right, or a preacher, or a guy with tattoos all over his body walks into the masjid and we don't know how to handle it, that's our problem, not his problem. That's our problem. We don't know how to deal with them. We don't know how to deal with the larger society. And we were here to deliver this message, to carry its message in our, in our speech and our actions. In the, in the four or five minutes that I have left, I want to share with you a, a couple of things that are hopefully food for thought for you and your family, inshaAllah ta'ala. First and foremost, there are two things about the, about the Qur'an that, at least the Qur'anic studies, not larger Islamic studies, just Qur'anic studies, that all families should be aware of. This, this book is something we should understand, but it's at the same time something we should appreciate. The Qur'an is not just something to be understood, it's also something to be appreciated. What does that mean? We have to appreciate the fact that this is actually from Allah. We have to appreciate the fact that a human being couldn't possibly...